All right, hello friends. Welcome to the Bears Gym for Bible study today. We are continuing our Old Testament Bible study in the book of Isaiah. Not a long book, not an absolutely short book, quote, chapter, but a moderate chapter as far as the prophets go. Isaiah has some long ones. Today is kind of in between. Not too long. So we should be here 10, 15 minutes for a little Bible study. That's not too much. So, so don't be concerned. Um, hopefully I won't put you to sleep. And both you and I will learn a little something new. And we'll learn a little something old. And get refreshed and reminded of the things on high. So here we go. Isaiah chapter 17. The burden of Damascus. As those of you who are versed in the cities of the world, you will know that Damascus exists now. I believe it is one of the oldest cities that is on record on the earth, and it still exists. Uh, one day, Damascus will not be the, the ism uh, city that it is now. One day, uh, many, the predominant uh, let's we'll say religion, but view, belief. In that day, when we get past the judgment time, today is a judgment, Isaiah has many judgments. Uh, one day, the Mideast, which is very predominantly uh, Islamic, uh, Muslims, uh, will one day uh, turn to Jesus Christ. Uh, today we will see a judgment upon Damascus, that is prior to that time, and, and by the, the, the instilling of this chapter, we see that Damascus has gone through a lot of troubles, but not like this one. Um, um, but after this time, there will be somewhat of a revival in the city, the region of Damascus, which now modern day we call Syria. In that day, maybe it'll be called something different, but Damascus will still be there as a whole, um, but it'll be a, a small cluster compared to what it is now. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. They did, and they, as they do now, serve false serve a false god, a false religion. The cities of Eror are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. glory of the children of Israel. It's kind of interesting, the Mideast, we kind of know what to expect. But in the day that the Lord talks about it here is Syria and predominantly much of the Mideast will turn to Jesus Christ in the latter days after the tribulation period and when the thousand year reign is upon the earth. And they will know the truth. And they will probably shudder to think of what it was their fathers and their ancestors believed in. Nonetheless, they will see the truth, and they will turn to that truth in Christ. In that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. And it shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm, it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. The gist of that is, is that there will be very few, very little. As if there was a blight, a judgment from God, obviously, in a sense where the crops are leaned out like a pestilence. Uh, famine, whatever it is, it will be severe. But 
whenever God judges a land, frequently he leaves a little remnant so that they can declare the glory of God and his mercy upon their lives. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it as a shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bow, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. Um, in modern times here, we've seen God's judgment upon various nations, upon Haiti, um, in the Indonesian region, um, with the great tidal waves, uh, Japan, and they could have been more severe. But God left a huge populace for them to see and call upon the mercy of God. Many of them did not, let's face it. America has been gone under various judgments, and some of us have realized God's mercy upon the land. Others have not, okay? But he is still trying to speak to nations as a whole. And there's only one way God can really get our attention when we listen, and that's chastisement, the chastening hand of the Lord. It's a necessity in this life. We learn obedience to God through many sufferings. It just, it's just a, a fact. As a father disciplining his son, that the son learns by obedience to his father, that if he doesn't obey, there will be chastening or discipline. The chastening hand of the Lord is necessary upon nations and man. At that day shall a man look to his master, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. He shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the grooves, the groves, or the images. In that day shall his strong cities be as forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be desolation, desolation, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. Frequently I see, even in my broad family, excuse me just a sec, the bear is sweating kind of heavily already. And that's good because men sweat, okay? That's men should sweat, you know? If you work hard and you're a man and you lift and you, you know, you have dealings in this life and you're a man, it's hot out, you're going to sweat. And that's good. So bears sweat, men sweat, okay? <laughs> the strong cities forsaken. Why? Because they forgot the God of thy salvation. There's only one God of our salvation. He was known in the Old Testament, same God, same person, Jesus Christ, as Yahweh. Different characteristic. He hadn't come to be known as the Savior, the Mashiach, Yeshua, as we know him now, but the same, same person, dealing with the Son of God, the God in bodily form. He dealt with them in the Old Testament in a little different way, and he deals with us now in a much freer way, but also a more uh, sacrificial way. In other words, when you come to Christ, it's everything. And it's everything about you. And he deals in the heart, not just in the uh, making sure that you're doing the sacrifices and doing the commandments and the rituals and so forth. But he deals more in the New Testament. It's easier and freer, but it's more complex because it goes deeper down into the inner man. And you can say, well, one is better than the other. I, I don't know, but... It's the way that it is. And it is by faith in the Old Testament like it is in the New Testament. And we're dealing with the same God and he's given us the freedom of coming to him by faith. And by coming to him, there is a price. There is a price because once you become a son of the kingdom, it is, there is a requirement of obedience, a son or daughter of the kingdom. There's a requirement of obedience. And so you can never come to the light of Jesus Christ, that light, that shining beacon, taste of it, and then go away and not be the same. That doesn't mean that you'll inherit eternity just because 
I don't believe in once saved, always saved. I don't believe that, okay? If you come to Jesus Christ, then the necessity of you representing a son and a follower of Jesus Christ also comes to play. Do we sin? Yes, we have the capacity of sinning. All men, we have the capacity before Christ and after Christ most especially because when the temptations will settle in because we're made very acutely aware of the sins around us and so we're more aware of what's going on and therefore the temptation hits the Christian I think harder than the non-Christian because not necessarily because he doesn't know better but because you are made aware of the knowledge of good and evil more so kind of like music it's like I really don't even care what the lyrics are as long as the music's good predominantly, which is why I like German music or even classical, you know, where they're singing in a foreign language and you don't really understand them, you just enjoy the music. But in this day and age, if you take time out and actually sit down and listen to some of the music, the lyrics, you know, they're, they're, they're an abomination, uh, some of them. And so we get to the point now of making a change. And making the change in Jesus Christ, it's a wonderful change. And it's one that brings you close to God. And if I'm saying anything, it's that. To come to Christ and to change brings you close with God. And there's nothing better than having God in your circle of friends. Because when God's in your circle of friends, that, that love circle, the Father, the Son, yourself, your family, your brethren, the Father, the Son, yourself, your family, your brethren, and you keep that love circle going. And then you have the circles of obedience, faith, love, obedience, repentance, confession, faith, love, obedience, belief, confession, and repentance. It just keeps going round and round and round. And it's a love circle. It's a happy love circle. But there's nothing like having God in your circle of friends because it will last forever. And so that's why God judges us. He disciplines us because he is our savior and he wants us to spend eternity with him. So that's why God judged Damascus, Israel, America sometimes, a civil war that we had, you know, a great judgment upon a nation. We, we lost sight of something whatever it was, and a civil war shook our nation. And it doesn't mean, now I live in the north, and it doesn't mean that the north really was the righteous one. I'm not saying that. Or the south was the wrong one or the right one. I'm just saying is, it shook our nation. And uh, it was a judgment. Um, the Oklahoma Dust Bowls, tornadoes. And why does God do stuff like that? We say, why? Well, because God gets our attention. God gets our attention in a way that we can understand and listen. Okay, with all that being said, let's move along. He did it because they forgot the God of their salvation, verse 10. And hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. If you plant, there's two types of plants that you can plant. I'll, I'll just use the day now. I'll say corn. And then I'll compare it to the fruit of sin or the fruit of righteousness. You can invest your time in a study in the Word of God, or you can invest your time into emptiness, or even sensual, or, or fleshly, or godless things, and say, well, it's all good because I'm, I'm free in Christ. When you plant them seeds, at some point in time, they're going to grow up. They're going to grow up. And when you least expect it, they will bring fruition of that fruit to your life, either of evil, damnation, or of righteousness. Let's continue. Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas, 
and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. I believe there's a little bit of prophetic talk in there. We look in the book of Revelation. Satan is going to send the nations in mass in mighty numbers against Israel, not only in Jerusalem as we know it now, but where they've gone to hide with many good teachers believe in the Rock City, Petra region. Um, but Satan is going to send the nations after them, the great armies, and God's going to open up the earth and swallow them up. He's going to judge them for trying to judge his people. We see Germany was judged. I'm of German ancestral background to some extent. And they caused a couple of world wars and brought a lot of grief to the Jewish peoples. God did judge their nation. They were, that nation was divided, was salted with plagues and, and, and strife for decades. And now God has lifted his hand off of them now. And I believe they've been very contrite. And he, he's allowed their nation to be blessed now, very much so. Here we go. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee afar off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. Israel has been despoiled, and I'm going to say raped, that's not really the right word, but raped and pillaged, probably like no other nation on earth. And unfortunately, I have to say this, it is because they rejected God Almighty. In the Old Testament, they rejected his hand, telling them not to worship idols and so forth. They rejected his hand, his love of bringing them out of Egypt and giving them a nation. They, they rejected. They practiced idolatry again. He said, fine, off you go. He sent them off into captivity in nations where they are abused and oppressed. And now, in this modern day, 2014, Israel is oppressed and bombarded with terrorism acts of hatred, discord, political turmoil, very much, I believe, because they've rejected their Messiah, their Mashiach, Yish Yeshua. They say they worship Yahweh, but really they just worship rot, because if you say you're going to keep the law, where's the animal sacrifices? Where's the priest? Where's the temple? Where's the Passover that was kept according to the word of God? But see, Jesus was the final Passover. And they reject that, so they try to go back to the Old Testament. Not all of Israel. There are born-again Christians that are Jewish, Israeli. Many. Very much so. And, and they're blessed in the middle of a nation that are God's people. But they reject him. They want to have a Passover, but they don't want to have a Passover where Jesus Christ is involved because the Passover is a picture of Jesus Christ. Okay, well, I think we did pretty good. I don't know how long we took, but Isaiah chapter 17. Uh, we made it quick. Hopefully you learned a little something. Hopefully we uh, both were refreshed and uh, just studying the Word of God a little bit. And so from the Bears Gym, we're going to pass along the baton. And uh, we will see you next time. God bless. We'll see you.